Okay, Christopher Warren. First question. With the global study of air travel and food allergies, can you describe the purpose and method of the study? Sure. I mean, well, I think the, the general purpose is just to inject some much needed data into the conversation around what's happening with food allergy management at 30,000 feet. And we hear a handful of kind of just one-off tales often of really unfortunate events that, that occur uh, often with mismanagement um, and that, that uh, you know, impose a lot of burden and anxiety on the folks involved. Um, but there's been, to our knowledge, no systematic effort to collect experiences from a very, both like geographically and sociologically diverse uh, cohort of, of patients in the US and especially not globally. So that was our goal to just go from individual case studies to a more systematic uh, survey of affected patients and uh, their families. So we went up, we over a period of years have been slowly <laughs> percolating these ideas and questions and it all coalesced in the past few months um, with the finalization of a survey instrument which we partnered with 45 different patient advocacy and uh, research institutions in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK to all simultaneously survey our respective membership um, and find out what the experiences, the barriers, the desired facilitators are of air travel and food allergy management um, in the context of, of air travel. Chris, tell us about the survey's findings on anxiety in food allergy travelers and what would relieve that anxiety? Sure. Well, first off, I mean, probably the most clear finding of the entire survey is that air travel is anxiety provoking for food allergy patients and their caregivers, like full stop. 98% of respondents said that their food allergy or their child's food allergy contributes anxiety to additional anxiety to the air travel experience, which is already uh, an anxiety provoking experience for many, for many people. So it's, it's adding burden on top of an already kind of stressful and often cumbersome experience. And a, a fair proportion of those people who said that it added anxiety, said it added a lot of anxiety. Um, the, the counterpoint to that is that when we asked with the appropriate policies or implementation or consistent implementation of the appropriate policies, how much would that anxiety be reduced? The grand majority of patients and caregivers said that it would be reduced substantially, if not um, almost entirely eliminated with the appropriate accommodations and kind of consistent implementation of those policies. So that was, that was heartening because it gives us a way out and a potential solution. How common are in-flight reactions and are they always reported? Great, well, I do think it's important to, uh, you know, with my epidemiologist hat on, remind the listeners and viewers that we, we did not you know, sample a random group of people with this survey. We sampled a very large number of, of people who were very diverse in a lot of ways, um, but this does not give us a conclusive prevalence estimate of, you know, for every 100 travelers, X number are going to have a reaction. But I can say in this survey of almost 5,000 um, food allergy stakeholders, we observed 400, at, well, at least 400 reactions, because 400 people reported that they had had a food allergic reaction in the skies. Um, so it is possible that some people had multiple reactions, um, which, which is eight and a half percent of our sample. And yes, that, so that, the fact that we observed 400 reactions and when asked, did you either report this to the flight crew while it was happening, or did you report this to the airline upon you know, landing and resolving the, the reaction? Uh, only 60% said yes to one or both of those questions. Now that doesn't mean that the airlines didn't find out about it, because you can imagine if a flight is diverted or other things happen, it, it's just 
it comes to the general awareness of the flight so the respondent doesn't need to make a point of saying an allergic reaction happened, but I think it, it speaks to the general trend that we observed with some of our other questions, especially the one around um, whether or not folks disclose, always disclose their food allergy to the flight crew or to the airline when making their travel arrangements because we found about you know a third of respondents said that they deliberately did not disclose their food allergy during travel with the primary reason why that was happening being fear of you know quote getting in trouble or receiving an accommodation that actually was not desired or viewed of as helpful how will these findings be used Great question. I mean, so I think there's there's a few venues. One, just in a very broad sense, hopefully contributing to a more data-driven discourse around what's happening in the skies in the hundreds of thousands of uh, people, Americans at least, who are traveling with a uh, current food allergy. Um, I know there are certain you know policies that are under consideration in terms of you know, reviewing the contents of emergency medical kits, uh, you know, that, that these data might help provide some valuable context to, um, you know, beyond, above and beyond the, the sort of individual case reports. And so hopefully, you know, often in, in the field of public health and epidemiology, it's very helpful to have different types of data from different types of populations and yet bring it all together and you're able to arrive at a little more informed decision um, than if you're just relying on one or the other. So we're hoping that that will, will serve that purpose. Also uh, from a, you know, here we're at the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, which is you know, largely attended by MDs and clin clinicians. And so I think it is important that clinicians understand just how stressed out and anxiety provoking and generally burdensome the experience of air travel is for many of their patients because this is not something that might arise just in the natural flow of conversation or structured note taking in the clinical encounter and so care providers just might not understand the extent to which um, there are some steps that could be taken to potentially alleviate that that burden and including something as simple as printing out a form letter saying you know that, that they could provide to airlines when they're asked for a doctor's note around you know receiving a food allergy accommodation because in our study we did find that you know 10 percent of the time when patients were or caregivers were asked by the airline do you have a doctor's note just showing us evidence that you have a food allergy before we grant this accommodation they did not have that note and so maybe providers could kind of this might spur them to to take that small step of, of having that on hand we are joined now by Leanne Mandelbaum of KnowNotTraveler.com, who was a co-author on this study of flying with food allergies. What do the findings say about flying with food allergies? Well, I have to say, I, I really was taken aback at the high level of anxiety. I, I knew food allergies create a lot of stress, but 98% really, really struck me. And, and I hope it strikes everybody that looks at the study as well, because we, we have a lot of work to do and, and it's doable. So you know, nobody wants their patient or an airline doesn't want a passenger experience to be anxiety provoked, um, especially when there are small steps that we can, can, we can take that can really just get rid of that or, or dampen it down. So I think that was like the biggest aha moment for, for me. And I'm, I'm glad that the study brought that out. What messages are there in the data for the airlines themselves? I think the biggest take home message for me is we, you guys need to flip the narrative. You know, we food allergy passengers, we're not the burden you think we are. We're actually the economic potential that you don't realize we are. We are not necessarily searching for the best price or, or location. The, the data clearly bears out that the most important factors to us are how we're treated as insofar as flying with either our food allergy or our child's food allergy or our loved one's food allergy. and that's what's driving us and and the other important issue that the data really brings up is that we share we share good we share bad and 
those decisions, according to our data, are actually what's driving who you're going to fly. So have fair policies, treat us right. Not only um, are you gonna have repeat business, but you're going to have free advertising because we're going to tell all our friends and family and, and whatnot. And just also realize that it's not just the food allergy passenger that's flying. It's their parents, it's their colleagues, it's their sports team. So, you know, we have a lot of um, economic power and, and, and use us for that, you know, treat us well and, and we will be loyal and repeat customers. And every business relies on repeat customers. What food allergy experiences do you find the most striking within the survey? Well, the fact that over 11% of people in, who were surveyed were asked to leave a plane or were not allowed boarding, specifically due to their food allergy. Um, that's an alarming trend I, I have been seeing increasing in, in testimonials shared with me on my website, and uh, the data does start to bear that out. I suspect that we're going to see it increasing based upon the testimonials I've been connect, um, collecting of late, and, and that really does disturb me because food allergies are a legitimate medical condition. They, In the United States, they are considered a disability under the Air Carrier Access Act, and you should never be allowed to ask a passenger to leave a plane because they have a food allergy, period, and end of story. There's always a way to make flying happen and happen safely, and we see airlines accommodate disabilities all the time, mostly visible disabilities, and I think that's part of the problem that you don't see the food allergy passengers having a disability because they, quote, look normal. And, you know, you also um, see a lot of airline staff insofar as my collected ex experiences on my website, mocking food allergy passengers or ma making fun, and, and that's gotta go away too, because it's not okay for other disabilities, so it needs to come down to the wire for food allergy passengers as well, that, you know, don't roll your eyes at us because we've disclosed something that is a medical condition we can't control. Tell us when there were in-flight allergic reactions reported, how was epinephrine used? Well, 60, Chris, Chris addressed this where 60% where of, of people reported it to the airline and used their own auto injectors, and then 40% also used their own and didn't report. Either way, it was an overwhelming response of using personal auto injectors, and that bears out in what I'm seeing and, and what I'm hearing from physicians because airlines sometimes don't have the right equipment in their EMKs. They're only required in the United States to stock vials of epinephrine, and I've interviewed many doctors in my position as airline correspondent for allergic living that actually don't find the allergic concentration of epinephrine in the emergency kit. And in, in fact, uh, I was just having a conversation with a physician who found the allergic concentration finally when he was treating a three-year-old for a first-time reaction in the air, but there were no syringes. So there, there are reasons I think people are using their own auto injectors. I don't think the right equipment is on planes. Um, airline staff are not trained on allergies. They often don't even know. We've come across cases where physicians have used vials, but there's actually an auto injector in the kit, but the kits are either so disorganized or the staff doesn't know it's there that it goes unused. Finally, what messages are there in this survey for physicians and patient families? Physicians don't have time in their appointments necessarily to discuss travel, but we are seeing an alarming trend of either TSA or flight attendants asking for proof that you have a food allergy in order to allow you to carry safe medications, safe foods onto the plane without being harassed. And I do believe that we need to have a standard letter. I always carry one when I fly saying, my son has a severe peanut allergy. He needs to carry his epinephrine auto injectors and safe foods with him. And I think that that would tamper down some of the anxiety because I've had reports of people having safe food handled with agents who don't change gloves, formula for a child who's allergic on a long flight ruined because somebody's either opened it or you know, it's not supposed to be opened. So I think that having a letter 
would really, really help. And it should be standard when you get a food allergy diagnosis, here's your letter in case you travel. Cause guess what? We live in a global economy and people are going to travel. So I think having your doctor aware, it also would be nice for your doctor to talk to you about how to plan traveling safely. There are a lot of things we can do like pre-boarding. Not everybody in the United States knows that pre-board is a right guaranteed to you under the air carrier access at as a food allergy passenger. So your doctor should be able to inform you of this and other steps that you can take in the air to stay safer. And again, it's all gonna lead to tampering down that anxiety. So the good news, as Chris said, is yes, there are a lot of people that are really anxious about flying, but guess what? There are a lot of ways we can take that anxiety down. Some of it can be done right away now. Some of it we can do without even the airline's help. These are things within our control, within the physicians that we see is control. And, and they're easy steps. We just haven't taken them. So yay, I mean, some actionable goals that we could take right now to decrease that anxiety. So I'm so grateful to Chris and to the whole team at CIFAR for making this survey come together and to ask the right questions and, and especially the right questions to tease out this important data. And I really look forward to getting even more specific to some of those questions like you asked about the epinephrine.